Welcome to the Bill Cartwright Show with our special guest, New York Nick, my teammate, Toby Knight. Toby, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here. You know, it's uh, what I really want to come to do is to try to get to know you really, really quickly, have everybody know you. So let's let's start with this. Talk about where you grew up and talk about your mom and dad. Well, um, I grew up out on Long Island, uh, out in Suffolk County. We moved around a lot, uh, didn't have a lot of money, so I had a lot of motivation. Um, my mother and father were divorced, so I really grew up with my mom and my, my brother, Reggie, um, who's an, he's an excellent surgeon today, living, uh, actually running a hospital up in upstate New York. Um, my two sisters, Rhonda and Renee, you know, we were very close uh, with my mother, Blanche, and uh, she's passed away now, but uh, she was really a lot of motivation for me to, uh, to do some of the things I've done. Talk about yourself as a high school kid. What kind of kid were you? Were you a sports kid? Were you a student? What, what kind of kid were you? That's interesting. Um, so we moved around a lot. We were very poor, you know. And so uh, uh, what I really learned how to do was to make friends because I we, we, just, we were just moving a lot. You know, so uh, I remember in fourth grade, I went to three different schools. So you learn how to make friends and you learn how, what all the, you learn really early what all the different cliques are. You know, you go there and uh, this is the, you know, I don't want to use the term that they used to call them, but let's just say you got your athletes, you've got your cheerleaders, you've got your, your guys that are in the science clubs. Um, so you just learn, like you can just go into a new cafeteria and you can just see all the cliques. And uh, I remember, you know, a lot of people would say, well, why are you talking to that group? And I was like, I didn't know anything bad about that group. I, they, were, they were willing to talk to me, so I was willing to talk to them. Uh, so I, I think uh, one of the most telling things, when I was in high school, I was, the, uh, I was a senior. In my senior year, I was the, the vice president of my senior class. And so my friend Eric Rhodes and I, you know, we got... We, we said in order for us to win, he became my campaign manager. We've got to get all these different cliques. So we got uh, Pete, who was the president of the class. He was a very, very bright guy. We got a cheerleader. Uh, I cannot remember these folks' names. But, uh, and then we had a business guy. So we got all of us together so that we could address all the different cliques in the school. And we all won. And that was, uh, that was my senior year. So we just learned how to, to get along with a lot of different people. Um, it was interesting for me because I always had a group of friends with, with basketball, with sports. I played a little bit of football, but mostly track and, and, and obviously basketball. So I got to uh, always have a group of people that wanted to be around me because I was, I was tall. I was pre a pretty good athlete. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, people wanted me on their team and that, that kind of thing. So I always had that as a, as a kind of a, my, my teammates in sports were kind of like my baseline, but I always kind of reached out past that and, and tried to make friends with a, a lot of different people in the schools. Talk about your athletic career. And we knew you ended up playing basketball, obviously, but talk about who influenced you. Well, ah. I mean, I loved to see, I loved Pete Maravich as, as a, just someone that I, I just, I knew I couldn't, I didn't have his skills or anything like that, but I just used to uh, love the way that he played. Um, but most of all, I think what influenced me is just going out and playing like local basketball people. We had a kid by the name of Bobby White, Leroy White. Um, he had come back from Vietnam, and so he was older than I, I was, but he was maybe 6'4", and I used to go play with him. He's several years older than me, and I used to see him, you know, get the rebound and take off, and that kind of inspired me to do the same thing, and I was probably 6'7", at the time, and, but he was like a real role model for me. I think for me growing up, 
in my early years, it wasn't so much, you know, we didn't watch TV. We didn't have cable television. So what we did is we went out and played. And so uh, a lot of times people would ask me, who's, who's your, you know, who do you look up to in college? Who do you look up to in the professional? And I didn't really have an answer for them because I was too busy playing rather than watching the games on TV. But at the, you know, when I got a little bit older and I, I did watch some games, I, I loved the way that Pete played. But probably the most influential person was a guy by the name of Leroy White, just a guy that I played with um, on the courts. We used to play at a place. This is this is a fun story. We used to play at a place in Port Jefferson called Rocket Park. And when I first started playing there, um, I was maybe in maybe 10th grade. And it was just Bobby and his brothers and just friends, you know, getting together after school. As soon as school was out, we'd all go down. this. It's a park down in Port Jefferson, down on the water. We'd all go down to Rocket Park and we'd play. And over the years, Rocket Park became the place to play. So that by the time I was in college and um, we'd come home in the summer times, and we'd have guys that, you know, like Jeff Rulin, Jeff Van Bredikoff, if I didn't butcher his name too bad, Randy Smith, um, his brother, I think his brother's name was Billy. Um, so the Smith brothers would come out from, um, from Southampton. We'd have Jeff Rulin come in from Sachem. We had people coming from Brooklyn to play on this park in Suffolk County, Rocket Park in Suffolk County in Port Jefferson. And I mean, we had people from the city coming out to play on Sunday. So my friends used to get very frustrated because, you know, before it got big, they could all, everybody got on the court, you know, and you'd play, we play long games of 21, you know, and uh, when, when things got rocking, uh, the last, you know, like I said, my junior, senior year in college, we had to shorten the games to 11. There was only, and it was only two two courts and only one court people wanted to be on. And that was the main court. Um, but it was really fun to see that happen, that you had this, this little park that nobody ever heard of. And all of a sudden for two summers, we became the place to go uh, and everybody would go there and play basketball Sundays, one o'clock. <laughs> so it's your senior year and you are about to head off to college. What were you thinking and why did you end up at Notre Dame? Well, um, I would, a couple things. One is uh, I wanted to go to a good school. So by coincidence, Everyone, uh, I, I read in an article once, and I think it was in Sports Illustrated, and they said, Toby Knight's going to go to a Catholic school. I said, really? I didn't know that. And so I started looking at it, and they said, well, you know, in the article, they, they listed where I had gone on my visits. And so the first visit I went to was to Boston College. I went to Boston College. Now, there's a kid, Long Island, didn't know anything about colleges, right? And uh, And again, I'm not watching TV. I'm not, I'm playing basketball. I'm in the parks. I'm out there playing when I'm not playing, I'm practicing. Um, so Boston college, and I don't know how that one came up, but somehow the, I was recruited and I said, oh, fine, I'll, I'll go to, I'll go, you know, make that one of my trips. Didn't even know it was a Catholic school. So that's the funny part. Didn't know it was a Catholic school. Right. So, um, the second school I went to was St. John's. Now, if you're a kid on Long Island, Louis going Louis Conaseca, if I got that name right, yep. he's gonna he's gonna find those kids on the island and, and bring them in. So I really wasn't that interested in going to St. John because I didn't I wanted to travel. I didn't want to go to school on Long Island. I grew up there and lived in most of it. Uh, so, um, but I I went in for a visit and uh, and they were very nice and and that was that was great. Um, the next school I went to was a school by the name of St. Bonnie's, St. Bonaventure. Hmm. And I went to St. Bonnie's because my high school coach was a graduate of St. Bonaventure and wanted me to go there. So I went to St. Bonnie's. So you got those three, right? And then I go to Notre Dame. 
Now, my whole life, my brother and I, we grew up watching Notre Dame football, Michigan, Big Ten football. And so the only school I ever wanted to go to was Notre Dame. All the other schools I went to were just something to do. Um, and I remember telling my guidance counselor who was, was helping me through this all, I said, you know, we were get, we started getting these letters and, and you, you've experienced that with the letters start coming in and at first it's one school, then another. And, you know, they, they started about my sophomore year in the high school. And then I moved to another school, <laughs> which I, I tend to do a lot. Uh, and I, I ended up my last two years at Port Jefferson had a really nice guidance counselor. And, uh, and these letters are coming in 25 a day. I mean, just ridiculous. And I just told him, and he goes, Toby, do you want to go visit any of these schools? I said, well, when the letter comes in from Notre Dame, tell them that they can just stop. So I really just waited on that letter. Um, and then finally it came in and, uh, and that's where I ended up, you know, I ended up going, but that was the only school I was really ever interested in, but getting back to the article, uh, you know, they said I was going to a Catholic school that I really never it wasn't until years later that I put all the pieces together to figure out why, why would they even say that? I had no intention. I was going to go to Notre Dame or some other school, but it wasn't that I was intentionally going to go to a Catholic school. Uh, but that was, that was an interesting thing that they wrote and that they said. So you're at Notre Dame. Talk about your first thoughts of the school when you got there, your first impressions. Talk about your coach and and who were some of your teammates. Um, well, it was a beautiful campus. It was a very impressive place, but it was a very scary place at the same time. Um, I loved Notre Dame. I loved going there. I loved the whole experience. And I remember talking to my friends, you know, when we were getting up in junior and then senior year saying, you know, they're going to throw us out of here. You know, we, we've got to move on. But uh, I, it was just a wonderful experience and a wonderful place to go. At the same time, it was scary because this was 1973. In the first year that I got there, the first weekend that I got there, we were told as, uh, as African-American athletes, don't go off campus this weekend. And I was like, why? And it was like, because the Klan is marching downtown. So that first weekend, <laughs> a big wake up call coming from Long Island, coming from a, a very liberal, diverse community. Again, I went to my, my high school only had maybe 400, 500 kids, only maybe five, six black kids in the school. So I didn't have any problem with races and different, you know, different people. I always learned to get along from the very beginning. So I get to Notre Dame and the Ku Klux Klan is marching down Main Street. I was like, wow, okay, this is different, you know, uh, never saw that before. Um, but that was, that was, it really didn't affect me so much as just, just, you know, a wake up call that uh, there's people that got different opinions on things. Um, my coach, Digger Phelps, we had our differences, I, I'll just say. Uh, I think on the one hand that he was a, a brilliant coach from the prospect of teaching. Um, I don't think, no, I don't, I would go even further and say I would not have been a professional athlete. I would, would have not have played professional basketball had it not been for Digger Phelps. Uh, for me, I needed somebody to push against, and, and he was that person. And, and that's just the way it was. We, uh, we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things, um, but he taught me how to play defense because I only wanted to play offense, you know. Um, but when I, the reason I was uh, drafted by the Knicks was because of my defensive ability and my, my, I think my rebounding ability, and that all was taught at Notre Dame. I mean, uh, I remember when I was in, um, I remember my brother, my brother, my brother was a great person, is a great person, was a great athlete in high school. Now, this is what I had to, you, you, you might have experiences or heard experiences like this, but my brother was, he was the captain of the football team. He was the captain of the, of the uh, basketball team. 
he was the senior class captain. That they had a senior class. Not it wasn't just a senior class, but he was the president of the school. He was a national honor society. I mean, these are some big steps to to kind of walk in, you know, uh, or follow up in. And uh, he was he's three years older than me, so I got to play with him in some of his friends. And I think that helped me when I was in high school and in junior high. But the point I'm trying to make here is that, so I, I'm a senior and I have my brother come and see me play. And he comes in and I score 36 points. And, I, and we win the game. And at the end of the game, I go home and then we're having dinner. And my brother goes, you don't play any defense. I go, what do you mean? He goes, everybody else in your team is shutting people down or denying the pass, and your guy is always the outlet. They can always pass to the center because you're just standing in the lane and you're not covering them. And I was like, wow. I, I, did, I had never really thought about it. I just, I just thought about the offensive end of the game. And so that really made me, um, made me much more aware of that there's actually two sides that go on here. So I get to college, and I was – I had a lot of athletic ability, but I didn't have a lot of skill in playing defense because I really didn't have to do that in high school. So Digger taught me all that. He taught me position, taught me how to defend a low post, taught me how to deny passes. I mean, we had drills where we could just shut people down defensively. Notre Dame, if you go back and look at our tapes, we could, we could shut people down because we just didn't allow them. It was like, you're just not even going to get the ball in bounds. You know, or that's that. Now, obviously, they're going to get the ball in bounds, but that was the attitude. You know, it's just we're not going to allow you to pass just because you want to pass. We're not going to allow it. And so we had, we really came together as a team, and and that's that was really our attitude. And uh, I would just say that I became, you know, when I was at, like with the Knicks and everything, every, everyone would say, Toby, you're a really good offensive rebounder. Well, when I was at Notre Dame, they never ran a play for me, not once. The first time a play was run for me was when I was playing for Red Holzman, and they ran the, that play, the 2-3-F, if you remember that play. It was a play for the forwards, come off one side, swing around off a of double screen, and then you can get the ball on the wing, and you can do what you want to do with it. Uh, that 2-3-F play was the first play ever ran for me. And uh, I, so how did I get the ball in, in, in college, and how did I score? If you wanted the ball, I had to go get it, you know. So I really became a really good offensive rebounder because that's how, you know, that's how, like, it was easy. Once you got got there, you know, we actually learned how to box. You're an offense, but you're going to get position and then box out the other guy so that you can just catch the ball and go up. So we, we, we kind of learned those type of things, and that's, that's what I had to do to be successful. Talk about your best team. When you were at Notre Dame? Ooh, well, that's a difficult question only because I think my best team, I don't think I played with. I was a freshman and we had, you know, John Shoemate, Adrian Dantley. That's his freshman year. He was phenomenal, phenomenal player. Um, Gary Brokoff, Dwight Clay. Yeah. Uh, they were rated number one when they, that's the team that beat UCLA. Yeah. Uh, and ended that 88 game win streak. So that was probably the best team I was on, but I, I, I didn't play that much. That was my freshman year. The best team that I think I played on was probably my senior year. And we had, we had a lot of guys that, uh, the, the year after I left, once they got rid of me, uh, they, they went to the final four. So we had, uh, well, that, the two guys that came in was Kelly Tribuca and Orlando Woolridge. I didn't play with those two guys, but we, I did play with Bill Lambeer. Um, I think Bill had left school for a year. So on that team, we had Dave Batten, um, Bruce Flowers, Bill Hanslick, who had a, a pretty decent career. I think he played with Denver. Bill Hanslick had a very good career. Probably played the longest of all of us. Um, Rich Branning, Duck Williams. I think Duck played a little bit. Um, and I think that team, we, we made the Sweet 16 two years, in, uh, uh, two times while I was there. Made the tournament 
every year. I made the Sweet 16 twice. And I think that was one of the years, uh, that was my senior year. I think that was probably the best team that I actually, you know, played and had made significant contributions to. Um, and that was a lot of fun. Okay, so it's your senior year. What are you thinking? Are you thinking I'm I'm gonna get drafted? I'm gonna get drafted high. I'm gonna get drafted by uh, by who? So what what are your thoughts? And are you ready to go? Um, huh. I don't know if you ever know if you're ready until you actually get out there and you you get to that little level of competition. Um, I wanted to go. I'll, I'll I'll go back a little bit though. In high school. And in college, I never counted on making the pros. My goal was not to make the pros when I was entering college. My goal, now this is a poor kid growing up on Long Island, remember, right? My goal was to get a four-year degree. My goal was to get was to get a diploma. That was my goal. And I remember going and I would speak to all the groups, you know, they have you come in and talk to younger kids and that's what I would always tell them. You know, you could fall down and you could bust your leg and that NBA career is gone. And if you didn't take the time to take advantage of the, the, uh, the education, then you have nothing to fall back on. So my goal was to get a degree from Notre Dame. And one of the reasons I went to Notre Dame was because I thought a degree from Notre Dame might be more substantial than a degree from a lot of other schools. And I think that actually turned out, for me, turned out to be true. Um, so when I'm a senior now, and I had played against professionals because um, I can't remember the fellow's name, but he played with, he had played professional. He used to come back on campus and uh, he would, um, and we would work out together all summer long. You know, we'd, we would work out and uh just playing one-on-one -on -one full court which is interesting you know when you do that uh because you got to dribble you got to shoot you got to make moves at any rate um so i got i started to get confidence that i could play because i always felt like this move if i make that move that move that that'll work just about on anybody um and if you can shoot the ball it's going to work and i can play defense so I, I again not counting on it but just thinking that yeah i think i can do this and so um, what I had heard, well, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you another story that, that will kind of fill in some blanks. I think we're, I don't remember who we're playing, but we're playing somebody on the East Coast. And people are starting to say, you know, scouts are coming to, to look at us and, and, and it's getting toward the end of the season. And uh, so... I'm playing down. I'm, I'm doing what I do, which is I'm following. Somebody takes a shot off the, from the left side. I follow the, the ball. I'm going to come over on the right side to kind of catch it. I catch the ball at the baseline. I look up into the stands, and I'm looking directly into the eyes of Willis Reed. And I, I stopped. For, I froze for a moment because I'm from New York. Everybody knows what Willis Reed you could put a, a helm, a mask on them, you, whatever you want to decorate them with. I'm going to know Willis Reed. I look up, it's Willis Reed, and he's looking right at me in the eyes. So I catch the ball, I make a move, and I score. And I never forgot that, um, that Willis Reed was there watching me play. Uh, so I start to think, yeah, I start to think I'm probably going to get drafted. The rumors were that I would be drafted probably in the late first round or sometime in the second round. And that was fine. You know, I just want to get drafted at that point. I just want to play. Um, but it was, it was where I, I kind of started to feel like I could do this, but I, I obviously got to keep working at it. And, and that was the other thing with me is I, I've always had the attitude that there are a lot better athletes than me. There's a lot better players than me, but I'm just going to, work harder than anybody else and so if I just continue to work as hard as I can then I'll be successful and that always seemed to work for me and that's something that kind of carried on into business that you know 
the people that worked the hardest. And I, I saw people that came in the school that had more talent than me. And by the time I graduated, you know, I was somebody that they were looking at to go into the NBA and, and maybe some of the other folks were not. Um, you know, all the big names, all the dapper dandies, you know, all of those guys don't make it to the pros. You know, it's guys, some, sometimes the guys that you never heard of, you know, like, like a Toby Knight that wasn't, you know, they said I wasn't aggressive enough. I, I was too skinny. I was this, I was that. But I just kept working. I just kept working at it and kept my head down and kept, kept moving forward. And, uh, and I got drafted by the Knicks as the, the third, their third pick in the second round, 10th pick in the second round. And uh, it was completely different. That experience was completely different than what they have today. You know, today it's on television and it's all blown up on ESPN. And, you know, where's this guy? You know, I had to I had to wait to after the draft to go buy a newspaper to find out that I was drafted. You know, uh, so that's how that was. Uh, and I was a second round pick, you know, and uh, I went went and read it in the newspaper and then went home and showed my mom. And we were just, it was a pretty emotional time. You know, we were very happy about it and very pleased with it. But I had heard that the Knicks were interested. I heard that uh, the Houston Rockets were in interested. But uh, there was, no one ever contacted me from either either club. And uh, you just waited for the newspaper to come out because it wasn't even like, it was on ESPN. There was, there was no coverage. You know, I don't know how your experience was, Bill, if that was, you were, you know, you were a first round pick. So uh, it's probably a little different for you, but, uh, you know, second round pick guy here. So. Yeah, mine was a bit different because I, <laughs> well, you know, not to that, that extent because we're pretty similar in age, but I did go to the draft. And um, so I was there, but it was, there's no, it, was, it wasn't any hype. I got picked. I went to the stage. They put a hat on me. I got interviewed, and I went home. What was your? What was your? Uh, what? What number were you picked? What was your? Were I was you the third, first pick. I was the third pick. Third pick in the first round. Yeah, we had this guy, Magic Johnson. Oh yeah, was he and Larry picked? In, was Larry? Larry Bird came out that year too, didn't he? Larry was actually brilliantly by Boston was picked the year before. Oh, so I think he was taken seventeenth. The year before, that's how brilliant Boston was. Wow. Huh. So, so they, they picked him, waited on him, and just incredible. So um, I ended up uh, picked third. David Greenwood was uh, second. Uh, he went to Chicago, and I ended up in New York. Well, we were, we were very fortunate and happy to have you. I can tell you that much. Well, Let's let's talk about this. Talk about your first year in New York. You, you mentioned Willis, but talk about uh, talk about that. Talk about what you had to learn. Talk about some of your teammates. Well, um, I guess I guess it was for me the the big experience was just being a professional athlete. You know, being around all these pros. I mean, I think. When I came into camp, you had – now, keep in mind, I'm in eighth grade. I'm uh, at a dance with my friends from Center Ridge High School. Um, and we're listening to the Nick game because they're playing in the playoffs. So we're listening to the Nick game on the radio. And we're listening to, you know, Willis is playing, Frazier's playing, uh, Monroe's playing. Um, Phil Jackson. So you had, this is, these are the guys I looked up to and, and grew up with. Now, keep in mind, yes, I'm going outside, but you in New York, you, you know, you're not oblivious to what's going on in, in the world of basketball. So when I go into training camp and I'm, uh, I'm there the first, the first couple of days, Walt Frazier was there. Willis Reed is my coach. Um, Bob McAdoo, Spencer Haywood, Jim Clemens, Jim McMillan. No, Jim Clemens actually came in because he was traded to Cleveland for, for, uh, for Walt. Um, so these are kind of like legends, you know, yeah. we had a team of legends. Um, 
And I think that team made it to the first round of the playoffs. We beat Cleveland in the first round and lost. Uh, but that was an amazing, just, it was just amazing to just, you know, these people that you've really only looked at on television and, and now all of a sudden you're, you're up playing with them. I'm practicing against them and, and, uh, and they were all nice people for the most part. I, I really, I really enjoyed my, I, I think college was really where you put in the work. The professional uh, playing in, in the pros was much easier because you didn't have the classes. You know, we actually graduated in four years. We didn't, we weren't on that five or six year program. Um, we didn't have tutors that traveled with us. You took your books and you got your work done. And if, if anything, you got a couple more extra days to submit your paper. But uh, you were really student athletes at that time. When you got into the pros, that whole issue of the books was gone. The, you know, So you had a lot more time to spend. And then you just had a lot more free time because you just had more time there. And it was just a wonderful experience. Um, one of the things I, that that I will say is that we had we we lived in Long Island. I'm from New York. I'm living in Baldwin, and we invited the Knicks over to my house for Thanksgiving because everybody else, you know, they're they're all traveling. They're all from out of town, and you only get a, a day off or so if you get that day off. So um, my neighbors were great. I don't know if I told you the story before, but they they realized we were having this party for the Knicks. They came, they got, this is in the fall. They got the leaves. They cleaned my yard up. Um, they were just, they were just great. And so that night in front of my house, you've got, you know, I, I'm driving an Oldsmobile. <laughs> Oldsmobile 898 or whatever. And in front of my house, you've got Bob McAdoo's Excalibur and Earl shows up with his Rolls Royce and, you know, Ray Williams has got his Mercedes. And I mean, you've got just on this corner lot, you've got all of these very expensive cars. And we just had a great dinner. And at the end of the dinner, some of my neighbors came over. I told them to come in and they got to meet the Knicks. And it was just a wonderful experience. So they were very, very kind and very nice people, you know, um, and they were very very accommodating to my neighbors when they came over to say hello um from 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 a playing standpoint i didn't play all that much but i i did get a chance to play a couple of games um i played against julius and p played against larry uh that now we're talking my first year as as things went on then i became a bigger had a bigger role in the team my second year when you when you joined us um but uh, it was it was really interesting playing against you know the Bob Lanier's and, and the Mac well played with McAdoo every day but uh, Wes Unsell and some of these just great legends uh, that were just fantastic basketball players. You know, I thought um, what's interesting is that your first three years, uh, I think you missed maybe two or three games. Yeah, if that. Yeah, yeah. I think I was. I, I, only, I only missed one game in those three years, and that was the night that Stacy, my daughter, was born. That was the only game I missed. Yeah, so it was really, it was really remarkable because uh, things were rolling for you. You're playing, you're healthy, and then all of a sudden, uh, you get injured. You injured your knee. Yeah. So what? What were you thinking at that point in time? Did you feel like this was it? What's that like? Because I think that that's really something that, uh, as an athlete, is your worst fear. Yeah, it's uh, something that you you hope you've prepared for, um, but it's just terrible. I mean, it's just it's just, it's just so so bad. Uh, well, well, how'd you do it? Talk about. I that. was playing. I was playing against um, the Celtics in the exhibition game. Uh, at the garden, I think we were playing up at the garden, um, the Boston garden. And, um, really, I think it was the wear and tear on my knees because I had felt some things earlier that summer. Um, you know, and you just know when you feel something in your knee that doesn't feel right, you know, you make a move or whatever, and you feel a little 
twang. But um, all I really did is I, I was chasing down a rebound and I just turned and jumped to make a move back to the basket. And that was it. Nobody touched me. It was just that twisting motion. Uh, I ended up tearing my interior and posterior ligaments. And I went down immediately and couldn't straighten my knee out. Cartilage was was torn. And um, that was pretty, pretty, it was very, as painful as that was, the surgery was worse. Um, so basically, they put me on a plane the next morning. I spent that night very uncomfortable. Um, and they put me on a plane and uh, flew back to New York. Went to Lenox Hill Hospital, met with the surgeons, Dr. Scott from Lenox Hill. My brother is an orthopedic surgeon. Um, so he came over, he came in and, and conferred with the doctor. And they, they based, he was my second opinion. What better second opinion can you have than your brother that's an orthopedic surgeon? And he agreed with, with uh, Dr. Scott that this is the surgery I should have. And so uh, a couple of days later, uh, I had the surgery and and then went home. And, and at that point, you know, again, things are so different today. You didn't have trainers. You didn't have, I mean, basically, <laughs> basically the Knicks gave me a, a, um, they made it, they, they, they made the arrangement. The, the Jets were using Hostra's, Hostra University's facilities for their training. And I didn't bald when I, I only lived a, a couple of miles from there. So they made it an arrangement so that I could use those training facilities. And then they gave me a membership to Jack LaLanne. <laughs> and pretty much that was it. Uh, they, they said, here's some exercises to do. And I just started talking to people about how to get better and started out. In the, you know, first of all, you, I think I did it in October. I didn't get my cast off until um, the end of December almost. I looked at my Lee and it was just my, my leg was gone. It just, the atrophy had set in. And so I had no muscle. I had to completely build back any muscle I was going to have. And just started out in the pool. Um, started out, they said, start out by walking around your dining room table. I've never forgot that. That's how they told me to start. Teach yourself how to walk by, because you can hold on to the table. Walk around the dining room table. Um, and and then from there, uh, you know, get in the pool and start walking in the pool and doing exercises in the pool. But it was pretty much left on your own, your own to, to try to develop, you, you know, the knee again. And, and slowly uh, I started building it back. And I had one goal at that point, which was to play again. I just wanted to get on the court again. Um, and the reason was for two reasons. I always, I always have a secondary motive when I, I do something. One is it would be great to play again. But my, my, the, the real thing in the back of my head is that by, getting, by accomplishing that, I won't be a cripple. I will have developed my knees to a point that I'll be able to have, a, you know, the rest of my life will be okay. Um, because I will have built that strength back in my legs so that I can, uh, I can just go out and have a, a regular life. So that, that was my goal was to, was to get back on the court. Let's see. So, um, I didn't play any, any, obviously that season I was out the following season. I, I came back, I think I played my first game right after Christmas or, or in January at some time, I actually got back on the court the following year. I played with the team for that year. Um, actually had a couple of good games, but my knee was just not the same. I, I was I never got the flexibility in my knee, and I don't have it today to uh, to be able to really run. Every step I took was kind of painful. Um, so it just wasn't going to happen. You know, I was never going to be able to get back to where I was. Um, the, sur the type of surgery that I ended up having today would, would be very uh, outdated. They wouldn't do what they did. But for, at that time, it was the best that they had. Um, but uh, 
uh, my knee, the flex, if, if I got the flexibility back of my knee, I think I could have actually play, played again. And right after that, a couple of years later, they came up with a different procedure that for their interior post, uh, interior ligaments that they were able to use cadavers uh, to, uh, to replace that ligament entirely. Whereas with me, they, they kind of used my hamstring uh, or a portion of my thigh muscle to, uh, and rerouted it through my knee and it, we have to go into all the gory details here but uh but uh to say that it 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 got me back on the court but i never got back to be a, being 100 percent. and for the other for me i just didn't want to i don't want to be that guy that didn't know when to go home so i just thought at the the following year i was invited to to come and play um but I just knew that I just, I was not going to be me. And I didn't want people to remember some guy running around, limping around the court. I'd rather have them remember who I was when I was playing well. So I, I retired. Yep, that's, I know that's really, uh, it's really hard. It's actually a nightmare. So now what are you going to do to, uh, to support yourself? Well, um, life after basketball, right? Yeah. Um, I had that one thing that I, I needed. At now I really needed it because, uh, you know, when we played, even for you, Bill, uh, you were first round pick and we won't go into numbers here, but you know, the numbers that they're getting today. Yes, we do. You, you <laughs> didn't need another job. You needed right. one contract, right? That first contract would have done it. Uh, second contract. Oh my goodness. Back in, in our day, though, um, it wasn't the same. So that's why that degree was so important for me to have. And uh, I just went out and uh, started looking for jobs, tried a couple of different things. I had to uh, put a, and I won't go into all of it, but uh, I had a resume out. The, 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 the uh, NBA did a great job here. They had a program for ex-athletes, ex-players for referrals. So um, I, I sent my, my resume into, into the NBA and a gentleman by the name of John Mayer, who was the national sales manager for Porter, Porter Athletic Equipment Company. He always thought that uh, a lot of people, and this is true, a lot of people like to hire ex-athletes. You got the name recognition is one thing, but the discipline to, in order that you have to have to become an athlete on a high level transfers into, you know, you're a disciplined person. You can control yourself. You can set goals. So um, he had contacted the, the NBA and uh, they gave him my, my resume. And he contacted me. Um, we met, flew me out to uh, Chicago. We, uh, we met. Actually, I think actually the first interview was actually in an airport at, at Newark. And then they flew me out for my second interview out in Chicago. Um, and they offered me the position of a regional manager for, for Porter Athletic. And Porter, if you don't know it, they, uh, they manufacture all types of gymnasium equipment for construction. So it's the overhead ceiling, suspended backstops, divider curtains, uh, wall pads, Matt Hoyce, all, all the different things that you put into new schools. And I remember I, I went home and I had a discussion with my mom. We were very close. And I said, Ma, I've got this opportunity to, uh, to work with Porter Athletic. She goes, Toby, I don't know. I mean, how many, how many of these things can they sell? <laughs> And I said, Mom, I don't know. My mother's name was Blanche, but I called her Mom. You know, Mom. I said, Mom, I don't know. But they seem to have made a career out of it. They seem to be making money, and they seem to know what they're doing. So we we, we agreed that, uh, all right, let's give that a shot. So um, so I was hired. I, I became a regional manager for them. I was the first regional manager that was actually outside. We were part of a growth plan for them to expand nationwide. And I was the first regional manager outside of uh, outside of the Chicago office, and uh, and and built a, a very good territory for them. I worked for them for seventeen years. 
So talk about after that. So that gave you a nice work foundation. So what did you do after that? Okay, so um, so I worked for Porter as a regional manager for 17 years. And, uh, and then one day, we were kind of called into Chicago, and we were told that the company was sold. And we were all out of jobs. I said, hmm. Wow. This is a company I had planned, you know, just like a lot of people. You, you find something that you can do. You're making money, and you're happy. And I was like, I can do this for the rest of my life. It's a decent career. Just got my third week of vacation, which they start with today. You know, you had to work for a while to get that third week. So I'm just, you know, I'm just starting to, to really take advantage of, uh, of my longevity there. Um, so we were told that they Porter sold to a company by the name of Gill, and we were told that we were all out of jobs. And so we kind of went home a little, little depressed, <laughs> trying to think of, okay, so what am I going to do now? I really didn't want to move. I, I like living in Pittsburgh and I didn't want to move. And then I really started to think about it. Now, for Porter, when I first started, they ran everything with a dealership. They had other dealers sell their products. We were, my territory and, and Porter started to make changes and they started to go direct. And so they had salespeople that would sell directly to the contractors. My territory had, very, we were very successful in my territory. I was running uh, about eight states here in the eastern part of the country. And I had my direct salespeople and I had dealers. I got home and I realized that Porter doesn't realize this, but they have a problem. We have a $2 million backlog and they just fired their salespeople. And, and in the process, they fired me. Not fired, that's not the right term. We were given, you know, we were given packages for and all of that. It wasn't really a firing, but they, they moved on from us, I guess is a kind of word. They moved on from us, um, but they have a problem. They've got $2 million worth of contracts and they got no one to fulfill them. So um, I wrote a business plan. I wrote a business plan that said, I will open up a company and I will fulfill these contracts and you will pay me the profit that's inside those contracts. And you will pay me a little bit more than that, actually. Um, so that's how, that's how Night Athletics got funded and started. Uh, we had the contracts that they needed us to do. I wrote a two-year business plan to, to uh, execute those contracts. That gave us a foundation to, because in, in, in our industry, it takes about a year like right now, we're taking contracts for 23 and 24. It takes at least a year for these construction projects to come out and, and actually start creating revenue. So um, I wrote the plan. I submitted it to, uh, to the management team there, and, uh, and they accepted it. And they funded us to, uh, and we obviously, we started out selling Porter. We continued selling Porter, and, and, but that enabled us to go out and pick up other lines to add to that. And so we picked up, uh, after about a year or so, we picked up Intercal, which is a telescopic bleacher line. And uh, we picked up an auditorium seating line. We picked up oper operable partitions and then all the other ancillary products that go along with it. So um, we were doing, you know, close to $5 million a year. Um, uh, it was a it was profitable business, you know, and uh can always do better but uh, we were able to survive the recession and, and the pandemic and uh and keep going and then after that which i know is your next question you'll ask well what happened after that so um this past november um i'm you know getting to the age where i needed to come up with a with a uh, an exit plan so uh, this past November, my wife and I uh, sold the company because my wife, Marianne, and I ran the business. I should definitely should say that because she put, she, my wife is a, Marianne, Marianne Knight is a elementary art school teacher who I talked into uh, opening this business with me. And I remember one day, I was sitting on my couch. This is before we opened. And I said, I, I was sitting on the couch and I said to Marianne, you know, they have a problem. 
And I said, would you like to, would you do this with me? Would you help me? Uh, I think I can write this business plan and I can uh, convince them to start, but I, I can't do it alone. So really for the last 16, 16 years, uh, she worked with me. She did all the HR. She did all the accounting side of the business. And I did all the selling and all the uh, operations, all the management of the, of the processes. Uh, but the two of us together, it took to, to make that happen. Um, so then after 16 years, we're getting up in age and my wife is really ready to retire. And, um, Marianne and I were trying to find, you know, okay, so where do we go from here? Our kids really don't want to take over the business. And, um, again, if you, it's kind of like you're, you're on this train and you really can't stop it. Because if you stop it, you don't have any revenue coming in and it just doesn't work. You really have to figure out a way to sell it. Um, and I had uh, a friend of mine from the industry, Dan Moran, in the H2I group reached out to me last, I guess it was last March. Uh, I think it was around that time. He reached out to me and, and, and approached me. They were targeting small businesses to, to uh, acquire. And uh, I sent them my financials and, and uh, you know, we negotiated all summer long. And then finally in November, uh, we pulled the trigger and, and they made the purchase. So now I am the sales manager uh, for a, the H2I group, which is just a wonderful experience. Uh, I love it. Uh, and I'll stay here for the next couple of years or three years, I, I told them. Um, but it's really a, it's, it's, it's a good transition for me. I don't have all the pressures of the day-to-day -day existence of running a business. And it's a lot. People don't, people don't realize how much you've got. Um, well, you've got your payrolls. That's one thing. So you got to you're constantly churning and turning money. Um, and so you've got to make sure that money is coming in so you can pay it out the other side. But in, in addition to that, you've got all the regulations that you have to have to, to run a business. I mean, all the, all the, the bureaucracies on the state level, on the county level, on the, on the national uh, federal level. I mean, it, it's a lot. There's a, a, quite a bit of regulations. And then you've got the unions and their, their audits and the insurance companies and their audits. And it's just running a small business. There's nothing small about it. I don't know who came up with that term, uh, but uh, it's, it's quite involved. And so I was really happy. Like now in my, my world, you, you're only seeing the background here, but I've got jobs here that I'm bidding. I've got specs that I'm writing. Basically, what I do today and what I did for Night Athletics from a sales side is, is to meet with architects and meet with owners, um, discover what their needs are, create plans, um, architectural plans, or um, if it's a job that's going to you know, work with an architect, you're making recommendations on, on what the products are, how they're going to fit into that building, what's the right equipment, what's the right level of equipment. And then you're, you're helping them create their architectural plans by giving, providing them information. And then you're, you know, writing specifications. And that's just the front end of the work. And then if you're fortunate enough to get the work, then it's executing those contracts with general contractors. So it's, it's quite, and so that's what I'm doing today. I'm working with customers. I'm working with architects. I'm working with general contractors. And a lot of, a lot of folks I've you know, spent the last 30 years developing relationships with, I'm working with those folks and uh, my phone rings constantly. It's rang, it's rang a few times since, since we started this meeting. Uh, and a lot of, you know, a lot of people tell me, you know, what type of advertising do you do? Do you advertise? I don't know. You should advertise. I can't handle all the phone calls I'm getting now. We do, you know, so it's, it's, uh, when you're in the business for that long of a time, and again, I've been doing this for 32, 33 years now, people know people that are building schools or building recreation centers uh, that are building churches that have gymnasiums. Um, 
they they know who's there. They know where to go. And Knight Athletics and now the H2I group is is who they call for for this market. Well, I think it's going to be really interesting after these couple of years when you're supposed to retire. I was <laughs> like, uh, you you're still enjoying what you're doing. I am, um, but I have I have other interests too. You know, I, as we were talking uh, the other day, I I like to write. Um, I've written a couple of stories um, that are kind of interesting, and um, I'm trying to find an illustrator for them. So um, I like writing. I like astronomy. I've got a, a pretty nice sized telescope. I like to start start you know look at it at night and look at the stars and. Uh, um, so I've got some, I've got some things that I want to do. I, my wife and I want to travel. We, we've got some things, but I, I, I know that what I can't do, what I won't do is just sit. I, 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 I'm, I, if I have seven days off or I've, I've got a vacation after about three or four days, no matter where I am, I'm ready to either go home and do something, go work in my yard. My, we've got a beautiful gardens in our yards. And so I've, I've got some things I, uh, I got some things outside of work that uh, that eventually I think I can I can call upon. You know, you uh, you talked about your wife. Talk about your family, kids. Um, what are they up to? Well, um, my daughter Stacy lives in New Jersey. Um, she has three kids. Um, she was working for Comcast. I hope she's still doing that. But uh, my daughter, Lilani, my granddaughter, Lilani, is going to nursing school at Rutgers. And um, she's uh, about to enter their RN program. So I'm very proud of her. And then Kara and Carly are, Callie are, um, are you know, one is, one's into gymnastics and, and the other just a baby. Um, then my my kids here in Pittsburgh, which are really my wife's kids, my step, my stepchildren are, are, I'm very close with them. We've got, um, Andrew's an attorney, uh, in Richmond and, uh, Gretchen's a, a drug representative, uh, and Megan here actually works here in my office. So, uh, we, we do all the normal things that families do. You know, we, we just got back from, from, um, uh, the Outer Banks. We went on vacation together. We have our Sunday dinners, and um, I I love the grandkids, uh, Ben and Jane and Drew and and Grace. Or you know, I'm very close with them, and um, just love spending time with them. Uh, some of them live in Richmond, so that's a little bit more difficult. But it's it's fun. It's it's it's. Uh, I guess it's normal, you know, it's just a normal, every American life that we have here with, with the kids. Toby Knight, thank you so much for being on the show. You've had quite an adventure. Uh, I really enjoyed playing with you. And, you know, what I want to say is that you were like one of the, I think, first, like tall, because you played three when I played. Yeah, I did. Yep. And it was like, wow, this guy's playing three. It's like, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty incredible. So you were like one of the first big threes yeah. uh, ever played. So um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, well, I just, I just tell you one thing I will add while we, well, before we hang up, <clears throat> being, being that three gave wow. me an advantage. I could post up the little threes and I could take the big threes outside. So I could quick enough to get around them. And, I, and, and that was my advantage. And then I could outrun them, whether they were big or small, because I was fast. Um, and and uh, Ray Williams, if you remember, of course. Uh, used to call me Secretariat. Because <laughs> I used to always run with my head down and I was so damn fast. Um, you know, so I, on the fast break, I could get out and I could move, you know. So that was a real advantage. And, and it was my recollection of, of when you came bill uh i don't know i'm just gonna say it so we used to call you remember we used to call you the ponderosa do you remember that <laughs> <laughs> bill Cartwright. uh you were just such a, a force on the inside and uh 
call you the pond eraser because you took up a lot of space, yeah. you know. And uh, but but I, I I'd say that today lovingly, you know, that uh, I really appreciated your you coming in and you gave us that inside presence that we needed. And uh, that team would not have been the same without you. And I I followed your career. I've always been very proud to say that I knew you win. And uh, I'm just happy for you. Well, thank you. And Toby, thank you for being on. Uh, let's stay in touch, man. I'm, I'm okay. I'm around. I don't go very. I don't go far or very fast. Not anymore. Okay. Well, you got my number, and I got yours, so we got no excuses. Awesome. awesome. All right, man. You take care now.